for being here. Um, just one thing. If you are going to ask a question, please ask it loud and clear so that the camera can um, hear you. All right, let's, let's start. Um, the real crash, OK? So I'm going to divide, divide this presentation in four parts. <coughs> the first one, I'm going to repeat the theory that I said uh, the last presentation, which is the optical theory of the business cycle. Then we're going to talk about the real crash, so what is, what is going to happen. Then we're going to compare the crisis of the 1920s to the crisis of the 1929. And then I'm going to tell you how you can profit from the coming crisis. All right? So the Austrian School of Economics is a small but growing community of, econ of economists. And this, these three are the, the fathers of the school. Ludwig von Mises, Murray Rothbard, and F.A. Hayek. The theory that I'm going to present today won the Nobel Prize in 1974, and it was written by Hayek. It's a theory that does not get recognition in mainstream economics, but mostly because they ignore it, not because they can refute it. Okay? So, what's, what are the interest rates, right? What's interest rate? Interest rate is the price of money. All right? And what Hayek was arguing in his important writings is that interest rates actually serve a purpose in the economy. Okay? They coordinate production over time. All right? You will understand it better in a little bit. Now, there are two ways that the interest, rate, interest rates can be set. Either by the market, like every other price in the economy, or by government which means central banks. Today, in most countries in the world, these interest rates are set by the government. There are very small islands um, that do not have a central bank, but for practical purposes, um, the interest rate is always set by central banks. Now, <coughs> the central bank in the US, for example, was founded in 1913, and, the, and in Argentina, it was founded in 1935. So countries existed long before central banks appeared, okay? Now, I'm going to put a video now. It's a three to four minute video. He's an actual economist, and he will explain the theory much better than I will, and then I will clarify a little bit, okay? Uh, I'm sorry, so this is the federal funds target rate. What the, what the central banks said is the, the rate at which banks lend to one another, okay? But all of the other interest rates in the economy are influenced by this one. So we can lump all the interest rates in the economy with this one, because every other interest rate is influenced by the one that is set by the government. Yes, Virgin. And for those of you in the room who are experts who are saying, I can't believe he didn't talk about the... Well, you're right, and I deserve that rebuke, but um, I I'll happily take an extra 15 minutes, but Doug French will never let me speak at one of these again. So, so just please just, just be patient with me. Um, let's just give the, the stripped-down version. Uh, it basically goes like this. What Hayek was arguing in his important writing in the 1930s was that interest rates actually play a role in the economy. They're not just arbitrary numbers. They play a coordinating function. And when they are permitted to play this coordinating function, what they do is they coordinate production across time. So that is to say, when we save more and, that, and interest rates consequently decline, that is the very time that it makes sense for businesses to produce goods and to engage in, in projects that are going to bear fruit in the future. Because when we save more, we're basically saying, I'm going to consume this portion of my income in the future. Well, that's the future that businesses are, are, are uh, investing for. And why are they investing now? Because the interest rates are low. And, they're, and the longer term their, their, their uh, production project is, the more interest rate sensitive it is. So it's going to give a disproportionate stimulus to longer term types of investments. So the interest rate then coordinates this. My desire to consume in the present versus the future, and businesses' production <coughs> processes oriented toward the present versus the future. Secondly, the very fact that I'm saving, 
that I've earned my money and have not returned back into the economy to take that money and claim all the resources to which, in a sense, I'm entitled, I'm actually leaving some of those resources out there in the economy. Well, my deferral of consumption, my, my releasing of resources into the economy, provides the material wherewithal to see all the new business projects undertaken by investors through to completion. So again, now the interest rate is coordinating this as well. The, in effect, the, the supply of real saved resources in the economy. And what Hayek said is that when you tamper with the structure of interest rates as the market sets them, you are introducing discoordination into this coordinating structure. So now, if the central bank, like the Federal Reserve, simply says, we're going to force interest rates down through our open market operations, the problem here is that in this case, the public has not necessarily indicated they want to consume in the future. They want to consume right now. They might want to consume even more right now. But yet, businesses are still being encouraged to engage in long-term investment. So people are demanding more of existing goods right now, but yet investors are being misled into engaging in long-term product development for new products in the future. It's a time mismatch. Likewise, if just because Ben Bernanke or Alan Greenspan says, hey, we're going to force interest rates down, that doesn't release any more resources into the economy. So you have an unchanged resource pool to fund a whole bunch of new investment projects. Well, how are you going to do that? They can't all be completed. So there's going to be a bust that comes. So this is the super duper, really fast <coughs> overview of this. So that's why simply saying, let's create more money and let's jolt that money into the banking system and keep interest rates down, that's not a solution to a depression. That's the cause of the depression. That's what gets people onto these unsustainable investment trajectories. And if you continue to do it, all you're doing is encouraging people to continue building things. Okay. Um, so one thing I'd like to clarify is that Remember that there are two ways that the interest rates can be set, either by the government or by the market. So if they're set by the market, what movement would make the interest rate go down or up, right? So the bigger the pool of loanable funds, okay, in the economy, the lower the interest rate. So the bigger the supply of loanable funds, the lower the interest rate. The, the smaller the pool, the higher the interest rate. When the government tamper with these interest rates, it sends a signal to the businesses that people have more money in their accounts than they actually have. So they are not going to be able to consume the products that companies are investing for in producing for the future. Okay, it's a time mismatch. All right, so that's the theory. Now, uh, this, this was from the presentation uh, for two weeks ago. Between 2000 and 2007, the Federal Reserve printed more money than in all the history of the Republic. That explains the big bubble of 2008, a little bit. Uh, and you, you inflate the money supply, and then that, that, that money goes somewhere okay, in the economy. Now, in 2008, it went into real estate. In 2001, it went into dot-com. Okay? So due to government pressures, threats with losses and incentives, the excess in the money supply went into real estate, okay? If you want to know more about this, the, the, you, uh, you can see the other, the YouTube video. Now you can see the house prices here, how they went up. Now, what, what, where's it? Now we saw, we saw this in the global markets class. So this part is the boom. And this part is the bust. The damage to the economy is done during the boom. Okay? The bust, because during the boom, the companies are investing in unsustainable projects, okay, with this unchanged pool of resources. Okay? And when and, and the bust is the the economy's way to going back to health. Alright? The damage is done during the boom. So you can see in GDP, uh, we can see the boom here from 2001, dot-com bubble, and then from 2001 to 2007, you have the boom, and then you have the bust. All right? Ludwig von Mises, he always uses this analogy. It's the house builder analogy. So we have a house builder that he thinks he has more bricks than he actually has. So he thinks, he goes to his warehouse, and he counts, and he counts 100. But actually, he has 50, okay? He made a mistake, 
All right, so with 50, he could build a 50 square meter house. With 100, he could build a 100 square meter house. Now, because he thinks he has 100, he starts building a big house because it's more profit, right? You're going to sell it at a bigger price. But the damage is not done when he realizes that he only has 50. The damage, which would be here, right, this, this down part, the damage is actually done when he lays the foundation of the house. He lays the foundation of the house too wide, right, for the bricks that he has. So the longer he, he waits to realize that he has only 50 bricks, the more wasted resources there are going to be in the economy. Because he, if he uses all the 50 bricks, he will have wasted 50 bricks. If he uses only one brick, and then he realizes, he, the boom will be much lower, much like this, you know? Okay, everybody, if, if you have any questions, just let me know. Yeah. Do you mean that there's a compounding effect, like you take longer to build? Yes, yes. So the bigger the, the, the injection of money into the economy, that will make the bubble bigger. And the longer you take to realize that what you actually have, it will, it will squash more resources. Okay? Now, what's the difference between the Keynesians and the Austrians? Yeah. So are other variables that they are not just the interest that are influencing to these, uh, to these? If there were no central bank, there would be no business cycle. So you're saying like that the only, the only reason why we have a business cycle is because we have central bank? Yes. Okay. So, so here, here you have it. So what do the Keynesians say? The business cycle is a fundamental feature of the market economy, caused ultimately by human animal spirits, okay? Also, they say that governments can lessen the effect of the business cycle through fiscal and monetary policy. So when, when there is a bust, the government uses fiscal and monetary policy to lessen the effect. What do the Austrians say? The business cycle is caused by governments artificially lowering interest rates, government interventions worsen recessions, with a free market interest rate, the business cycle simply would not occur. Okay? So that's the, the first part. Now, the real crash. W all right, so what's, what's going to happen? This is Peter Schiff. He is the CEO of Euro Pacific Capital. He's an investor, he's an economist, and uh, we're going to see a lot of him in this presentation. Okay, I'm going to show you a video now. Question. Will homes be worth more or less in 2007? Tom, what do you think? You can see uh, prices go up about 10%. Here's why. Because you're going to come into a regular normal market, and a regular normal market, that's about what kind of appreciation you get. Print is pr home prices up 10% in <coughs> the coming year. Peter, what do you say? Well, today's home prices are completely unsustainable. They were bid up to these artificial heights by a combination of temporarily low adjustable rate mortgage payments, by a complete you know, absence of any lending standards, and by speculative buying. And what's going to happen in 2007 is a lot of these artificially low arm payments are going to re be reset upward. You're going to start to see uh, both the government and the lenders <coughs> reimposing lending standards and tightening up on credit. And you're going to see a lot of the speculative buyers turn into sellers. And these sky high real estate prices are going to come crashing back down to earth. I, first of all, I have no idea what Peter Schiff is talking about. I agree with Tom. I think they're going to be up probably up to about 10%. What artificial lending standard are you talking about? Let's go to Peter. Go Most first. of the profits that people have in real estate are going to vanish, just like the profits in the, in, the, in the dot coms in 1999 2000. It's a fantasy. People can't sell their house. The inventories are exploding all over the country. Houses are on the market for six months a year. There's no bidders. So, uh, the price right. is going to fall through the floor. You guys I, are rooting your We heard it. it. We heard it loud and clear. All right, so he was saying this in 2006 and 2007. In fact, he wrote a book about the 2008 crisis, which launched in 2007. Okay, so he knew what was going on by applying Austrian economic theory. And everybody was laughing at him. Okay, and this is another speech he gave at the mortgage bankers speech. So he went to the National Association of the Mortgage Bankers and he gave a speech. Not right now, after this is 2006, November 2006. After this speech, 
they never invited him again. <laughs> Wait. I'm going to show you like one minute. Next, next question. We want to be sure we get him. Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, yes, Peter, as, as a lender, myself, and a, a, a property owner, and also a, a, a writer about real estate and what's going on, should I just slip my wrists? Uh, no, I mean, there's, look, there's no reason, look, you know, you, there's no reason to slit your wrist. I mean, you know, this is what's going to happen. But, you know, the statistics, I want to get, you know, the fundamentals here. You know, the, 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 the idea that there's all this demand for second homes, right? Second homes are in demand because people buying them are buying them because they think they're going to get rich on them. The reality is the demand for second homes is going to collapse. All these vacation homes are going to come on the prop on the market when people realize that it's cheaper to stay in a hotel when you take a vacation than to buy a piece of property. Also, all the home construction that's going on is being done by public builders who are building homes to maintain their stock prices so the insiders can keep selling shares even though there's no demand. You can look, I'm living in New England now, there are for sale and for rent signs all over the place. I mean, there are so many unoccupied homes. If there really were a shortage, I mean, there's so many homes, no one has never lived in them, no one's ever gonna live in them. There are empty houses. You can rent where I am now in New England, I know in California, houses that, are, that appraisers will tell you are worth four and five million dollars. You can rent them for six and seven thousand dollars a month. It is absolutely ridiculous. And the, the, the people who wrote that, whatever you were reading, Okay, uh, so the, this guy asked the question, he, he already gave the, the speech telling what was going to happen and this, this guy who asked the question is a mortgage lender and he has many properties so he asked him, that, like, should I split my wrist, you know, so if everything is going to collapse. Now, but 2008 was only a tremor, it was only a warm up, okay, so the real crash is coming. So the bubble, in 2001, the U.S. had a dot-com bubble, all right? So the, the, this excess in the money supply went into dot-com companies, all right? Now, when it, come, when it came crashing down, what the government did was not let the economy repair. They lowered interest rates even lower, okay? So they injected more money into the economy, and that money went to do housing, right? And when it crashed, sorry, one second. We're supposed to have this last month too. And so what time do you have? It? So thirty. Two thirty. Yeah. Okay. So the the when the housing collapsed, the 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 government pushed interest rates even lower to zero percent, and this money went into the government. So now the bubble is the U.S. government. Okay. Yeah. I wouldn't completely agree to it, at least from what I read, uh, the stretching of the first boom in housing. Like, at the time when it had to collapse, it, it, it was stretched by the rating agencies and the bank. Like, Goldman Sachs was one side shorting the market, the other side building more securities. And it's, it's a, in 2008, up. it's a, there are many things and... I would, who stretched I, it? Like, you said... We are, it, it's, it's in my uh, other talk. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I understand what everything is going on. That the government is artificially just like injecting money and making things worse. Uh, but at the same time, I feel like they kind of like avoid a very big disaster in terms of like you know. Okay. Let, let me. I, I know what you're saying. Okay. Just, you're gonna get the answer. Okay. So okay. so the government now is the bubble. All right. So what do you mean by government is the bubble? Um, do, do you see here the relationships between the crashes and the interest rates? So this is the dot-com bubble, right? They lowered the interest rates, and uh, when they, they, they didn't want to inject more money into the economy because of they were worried about inflation, they, they raised interest rates, so everything came crashing down. Because people are, are very leveraged. People are, have a lot of debt. So when the interest rate rises, the cost of the money goes up. So you cannot buy more debt. You, you cannot get more debt because it's very expensive. So it all comes crashing down. Then, again, low interest rates, uh, they, they increased the interest rate in 2006, 2007, and you know, all came crashing down. And now you see zero interest rates for like seven years. Now, in, this is like four or five years of very low interest rates. 
it caused the housing uh, bubble. Now imagine what seven years of zero interest rates could do to an economy. Okay. The same artificially low interest rates that made it easy to buy a house in the last decade are making it easy for the government to borrow in this decade. Look at the U.S. national debt. Today it's of like 23, 23 trillion. Now, how higher can that be? 40 trillion? 30? 50? You know? Um, so, not only ha the U.S. has debt, but it also has deficit. So deficit is, is when, you s when you spend more than what you get in revenues, all right? The US economy, it went from a savings and production economy, so it was, it was a productive economy with people where, where people have savings in, in their accounts, to an economy made of borrowing and spending. So the world produces and America consumes. America doesn't produce anything anymore, or very few. They, they, their biggest export is US dollars. So the Chinese, they make stuff and the US gives them money, all right? Now I'm gonna read a, a, a small text here. So how, how does America get away with this? Why does anyone lend us money when they know we're only going to pay back by borrowing? And that we're going to pay back with dollars that are worth less than they are today? We get away with it because the dollar is considered, considered the reserve currency of the world. In other words, all major governments hold dollars. As of 2010, 60% of foreign exchange reserves are in dollars. That means, as a foreign country, you're willing to take dollars because you know some other country will be willing to take dollars. If this sounds familiar, it's because we've seen it before. In 1999, people were investing in dot-coms, not because they thought these companies might make a profit, but uh, but because they saw, thought someone else would be willing to buy the stocks. In 2006, people were buying houses not because they thought the house was worth that much, but because they thought they'd be able to flip it for more money to someone else. This is only slightly different from a Ponzi scheme. It all depends on the existence of a greater fool. Eventually, you run out of fools and the bubble pops. When the dot-com bubble popped, companies evaporated and retirement accounts shrank. When the housing bubble popped, popped Foreclosures ran rampant and credit right, dried up. When the government bubble pops, the consequences will be worse. So Trump is talking about his economy, his big economy, the best economy in history. It's just a phony economy. It's just a phony boom. So he was criticizing Obama for his low interest rate that he was gonna he was gonna raise the interest rate and he was gonna tighten the economy and sh shrink the Fed's balance sheet. But what did he do? He raised interest only once and then he saw the economy getting a downturn. So what did he do? He put pressure on the central bank to lower interest rates again. You know, So giving more drugs to the drug addict. Instead of taking away the drugs and spirits of withdrawal, okay, they just give more drugs to the drug addict. So the Trump's economy is nothing more than a phony boom being pumped by cheap money from the Fed. And the Fed knows this, that they cannot raise the interest rate because if they do, the bubble bursts. In the long run, we're all dead. John Minor Keynes. That was the foundation of Keynes economics. The, economics. the idea is that you can keep blowing bubble after bubble regardless of the long-term consequences. Who cares about long-term consequences as long as we can put them off until after we're in the grave, or in the case of a politician, until after the next election? But the moment of crisis can be pushed off for so long. Imaginary wealth cannot indefinitely mask a weak economy. The government bubble is the final bubble. The bedrock of our bubble economy has uh, had always been the full faith and credit of the US government. At some point, the lenders of the world begin to lose their faith in us, and that credit dries up. Those who lend to the U.S. government these days don't expect tax revenues to pay them back. They know they will get paid back with more borrowed funds. Okay? Um, so this time around, companies, homeowners, and banks are, uh, are so highly levered that, interest high, that rising interest rates will be devastating. Anyone with an adjustable rate mortgage will see his monthly payment skyrocket. This will cause, this will cause more foreclosures triggering another collapse in the housing market. The tidal wave will also hit the banks and hedge funds that have already returned to pre-2008 game of risky bets and massive leverage. 
In fact, most of our banks are only solvent as a direct result of these low interest rates. Of course, the biggest debtor of all, the, the, Fed, the federal government, has the mother of all adjustable rate mortgages. Most of the national debt is financed with short-term paper, short paper, much of it maturing in less than one year. When the biggest spender takes up an austerity budget, a lot less money gets spent. Initially, this will cause some companies to go under, to go under and um, unemployment to rise. Other companies will expand and new ones will form as resources formerly used to support government spending are freed up for more productive purposes. But this transition, transition will take time to play out. The US is broke, right? So how are politicians going to solve this? There are two ways, the honest way and the dishonest way, all right? So what would the honest way be? Declare bankruptcy. Say, say to the lenders, look, I'm not gonna pay back. I'm, I, I, I can only pay you 30 cents on the dollar. 20 cents on the dollar. And then you start over, okay? That will cause a short-term economic pain. That will be like taking the drugs away from a drug addict. You're gonna sweat a lot, you're gonna have withdrawal symptoms, you're gonna be in a lot of pain. But it's the only way that you can get back to health, okay? But there's another one, right? The dishonest way, which I believe is gonna happen, okay? Um, so the dishonest way would go like this. Instead of this scenario of excruciating tightening, politicians could opt. So, so what we mean in the honest uh, part? Raising interest rates. Because if you raise interest rates a lot, you, you cannot get more debt because you cannot pay the interest. So you need to cut spending. Okay? And what do politicians not want to do? Cut spending. Again, the dishonest way. Instead of this scenario of excruciating tightening, politicians could opt to try to cover up reality one last time by pumping even more dollars in the economy. Need to pay off the national debt? Fine, just print more money and pay it off with that money. Need to pay for unsustainable entitlements like Medicare and Social Security? Fine, just print more money. Of course, the real value of these benefits will collapse, but maybe politicians could maintain a pretense of keeping up benefits. Some politicians might prefer this route because it could deflect some blame. They could blame businesses and service providers for raising prices. For example, in 2011, as oil prices rose as a result of the inflation created by the Fed, Ben Bernanke and Obama blamed the rise on oil speculators and commissions were convened to investigate the wrongdoing. But this path leads to hyperinflation, which will be even more economically destructive for the average American. Anyone on a fixed income will start, price and wage unpredictability would cause chaos more harmful than what would result from sorry interest rates. Okay, so the honest and dishonest one. I would like to talk, yeah. So how do you explain them if there is just this relation on interest rates and boom, that a country like Germany, that it has a very low interest rate, almost zero percent. Negative, yeah. It has, uh, it, it's, it's not growing right now. So be, be, it, because it's, it's like, it's like the fumes out of the car, you know? You can use monetary policy. But, but, but only for so long, you know, so, so, so Trump is doing this. Trump is, 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 there is in the United States right now, the, the quantitative easing that Obama did, Trump is doing it right now, okay? He's lowering interest rates, so he's using monetary policy to stimulate demand. But, but at, at some point, it, it, it doesn't, uh, so he only had a 2.3% GDP growth in, in 2019. At some point, you, you run out of, of, of steam, you know, it, it, it doesn't work anymore. Yes, but like, like for this reason, what I'm saying is that there is not a direct cause and effect. Because like here in Europe, for example, we don't see it right now. Like what I'm saying is that with this oh, the, the, really low interest rate, we are not quelling the economy. Like yeah, yeah. You're, you're actually stimulating demand. With, you have negative interest rates. So you're stimulating demand. You're stimulating people to spend because Keynesians think that that's how the economy grows. Okay. We are not booming the economy in a... No, it's, it's in an irrational way. In yes, it, yes, they, they are. That, that's what's, hap what's happening in Europe is like basically the, what if what you work in the United, what they expect to work in the United States is not working here because everybody's afraid of investing. So basically, what's happening? All the banks are booming, like they are keeping a lot of cash and they are not investing. So the, even what Canadians expect, that's not happening in yeah. Europe. 
Yeah. But in the United States, it's very different because the steam, because people like it's a consumer economy, so basically people keep spending. But here is not working. Yeah, 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 and I agree with that. But I just think that for this reason, there are other variables that people or banks take into account rather okay, than just like. Uh, uh, so let me, because okay. I think somebody's gonna come at two thirty. But you're talking about the theory, okay? But this theory won the Nobel Prize in nineteen seventy four. So it, it, it actually works, and it explains a lot of things. So maybe we can talk later about about this theory exactly. Okay. So what is inflation? All right. It's an inflation in the money supply. It's it's the government injecting money into into the supply, or into the market. All right. Now, uh, so inflation, it, the rising prices are not inflation. Rising prices are a consequence of inflation, because when the government puts more currency into the market, that means there's there's more supply of that currency, which leads to a lower price, lower value. So what happens? is that your currency loses value, so you need more units of that currency to buy the same product. Okay, so for example, when, this, when the Spanish conquered America, uh, uh, yeah, the whole, the whole continent, they brought a lot of gold with them, like a lot of gold. So the supply of gold increased, which means that the price of, load of gold decreased, so all the prices expressed in, in gold Increase, so you needed more units of gold to buy the same product. Okay. Now, if you support, and I, and I think many of you do, a progressive income tax. So the 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 higher your income, the bigger chunk the government gets. If you support that, inflation should be your enemy number one. Okay, you should be vehemently against inflation. Why? Because inflation is a tax that hits the poor disproportionately. Inflation is a tax. Why is it a tax? Because when the government issues money, <coughs> when they print money, it's not that, that the price of... They, they, like the Argentina government prints Argentinian pesos. It's not like the value of the Argentinian peso it lowers immediately. You know, it takes a while. So when the politicians use that money, it's worth more than when you're going to use it. Okay? So inflation is a tax. All right? And why does it hit the poor dispro disproportionately? Because people who have money, they can protect themselves against inflation. They, they buy real estate, they buy dollars, they buy another currency, they buy whatever. But poor people who live paycheck to paycheck, they cannot do that. They only have their paycheck in whatever currency it is, so the, their money is worth less. They cannot protect themselves against inflation. All right. So if you support the progressive income tax, inflation, you should be against inflation. All right. Now we all heard in the global markets class that deflation is terrible for the economy, right? So it, deflation is like a monster. But why? Two things: it disincentivizes consumption because people are expecting prices to go down, and the secondly, margins shrink, so companies make less money, which means less employment, which leads to less, less consumption. So number one, all right, we all buy iPhones. Like we know the the the, the price of the iPhone is gonna go down. But we buy them anyway, right? We buy clothes. We don't expect the clothes to be six months old that we know is going to be cheaper to buy it, you know? So we all consume, we, we all know that these products are going to go down in price, but we consume them anyways, all right? The other thing, margin strength. So it's, for me, it's amazing because you have the price and the cost, right? That's the margin. Now, they're saying that the price is going to go down. But what is the cost by a price? Now, why only this goes down? Why not both go down? Deflation is a, a, decree, a general decrease in prices, so both go down. Go down. In fact, margin, uh, deflation is great for the economy because when both prices go down, the, so, so, the, so the price and the cost goes down, you gain in volume. Okay? Out of the 30... Okay, let me... So this is the consumer price index, how, that's how you measure inflation. Look at this, so War of 1812, Civil War, establishment, establishment of the Fed, all right, then you have more wars, whatever. Look at, <laughs> look at, look at the, the, the trend here, okay? So the, uh, um, but for the Civil War, the US would have had 100 years of deflation. 
and that's when the U.S. got rich, right? That's the, the U.S. went to the whole industrial revolution without the Fed and with deflation. So, out of the 30 richest American people in the history adjusted for inflation, only three of them were born after the Civil War. Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, whatever, they're poor compared to Carnegie, Vanderbilt, uh, Rockefeller, okay? And the Fed also was established to maintain price stability. Do, 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 does this look stable for you? So for me, stability is like this, not, not like this. If the solution was to print money, we would all be in heaven, right? All right, third part. There was a crisis in 1920. I know that most of you don't know uh, because it's a crisis that, that doesn't get talked about, and now you're going to see why. So the Fed was created in 1913. Why was the Fed created, right? So money is a private invention. Before, you had gold, you went to the bank, and the bank gave you a note that would, was going to be redeemable in gold, all right? So the, the notes were issued by banks. Now, if I put my money in a California bank and I go to New York, they don't know that the bank in California is trustworthy. So the Fed was created to standardize the notes. All right. So the banks would send the notes to the, to the central bank, and the banks and the central bank would issue the notes like standardized for everybody. So that wasn't a problem, okay? But at the beginning, so so okay. So and the U.S. entered the World War One in 1917. When the Fed was created, the Fed was not able to buy U.S. debt, U.S. treasuries, because that was uh, dangerous, right? The, the government issues debt and the central bank buys it. So Woodrow Wilson needed money to finance war effort, so they amended the Constitution in order for the Fed to be allowed to buy this U.S. debt. Uh, and the phony boom came, right, because they, they injected a lot of liquidity, and then the bust came. One year, 17% decrease in GDP. 46% of its value. That's only one year. Now, Warren Harding was the president and Herbert Hoover was the secretary of commerce. Herbert Hoover said, Harding, we need to do something. You know, we need to, the government needs to intervene. We need to lower interest rates. We need to help the economy. We need to stimulate demand. Now, what did Warren Harding do? He did not listen to Hoover. The government slashed government spending, and the Fed did absolutely nothing, okay? In one year, employment had to 6%. In two years, unemployment was below 3%, and in four years, GDP was the same level as before the crash, okay? So the government did absolutely nothing. In fact, they cut spending, and this was the result. Difference of, with 1929. <coughs> so during the second half of the 1920s, Herbert Hoover was the president, and he, the, the Fed was stimulating the economy because there was a downturn in 1927. Also, because the U.S. had higher interest rates than the U.K., all the money was flowing to the U.S., so the U.K. was uh, losing gold reserves. All right? So Benjamin Strong, who was the chairman of the Fed of New York, he was buddies with the guy in U.K., and he was a big proponent of these low interest rates, right? So he dies in 1928, and the Fed sees that, okay, we made, made a huge, huge mistake. We created a bubble, so they raised the interest rates. And this is the stock market crash of 1929, okay? This. So when they raised the interest rates, everything came crashing down. What was the response? Who was the president now? Herbert Hoover. So he could do all the things that Hardy didn't allow him to do. He put pressure on companies not to lower wages, and he injected liquidity into the economy to stimulate demand. So, because in many school textbooks and in the Keynesian literature, Herbert Hoover is seen as a laissez-faire president, that he did not do anything. In fact, he was one of the most interventionist presidents in the US history. And Roosevelt, FDR, ran against Hoover by calling him a reckless spender and hey, saying that he would balance the budget, okay? FDR won, and what did he do? He grabbed all these Hoover policies, in Double them and call it the New Deal. <laughs> Hoover's and FDR policies are what prevented the market from correcting the my investments in the past years. So, this is the 1920 crash, and you see that here we're at, we're at the same level. Now look at 1930, the crash, 
Look at the, the recovery. What, it's called the, the, the 1929 Great Depression, right? Because the government didn't allow the economy to correct itself. The lesson has not been learned, and Warren Harding was the last US president to have a prudent monetary policy. How you can profit from this, OK? <laughs> what is the gold standard? Until 1971, the US was in a gold standard. The gold standard means that every dollar in the economy is backed by gold. It, it, it was redeemable in gold, OK? Why gold? Well, because it's beautiful, because it, it's, it's, um, it's very malleable and ductile, and it's resistant to corrosion, OK? Uh, well, the Fed was created on it originally, I already said. Well, so after the Second World War, the US had 90 plus percent of the gold of the world, OK? So what did the US do? They told the other countries, look, we've never defaulted on our debt. So why don't you take a dollar instead of gold, and then you take the dollar as a, as a reserve, and then you can exchange it for gold. And they, they will say, yeah, OK. So the US let the world out of the, of the gold standard, OK? Now the world is going to go back to the gold standard because the Fed destroyed the dollar. Because the, the dollar is, is not going to be worth more. Uh, I mean, with inflation, the, the inflation that is coming, the dollar is going be, to be worth less. So people are going to, uh, are going to seek for a uh, safe haven in gold. So gold is seen as a ha safe haven. Why did the 2008-9 bailout did not cause inflation? Because the US was the less worse among them all. Because Europe went to negative interest rates. Japan went to negative interest rates. Okay, so people were still, buy, were still buying dollars because the, because the, um, the, the interest rate was, was higher than in Europe and in Japan. And, and, but inflation also, it's, it's just government propaganda, okay? It, it, there's a thing called the Boston Commission in the 1990s. Uh, he wa it was created by Clinton. What did, what did the Boston Commission do? They said, look, I think that inflation is too high. Let's try to measure it differently to see if we can lower it down. So they, they only changed the way they measured inflation to lower it, okay? So they took up housing, for example. Housing is not counted in the CPI. Uh, life insurance and many other things, okay? Just, this is the last video. The only reason that we've had this rally in the dollar is because the whole world is convinced that what the Federal Reserve did worked, right? That what the monetary policy that they pursued, you know, fix the problem, save the economy, and that now the Fed can withdraw the stimulus. The Fed can raise interest rates, shrink its balance sheet, and everything is great. And because everybody believes that, they they bought the dollar. But the crisis is going to come when people realize that that's not the case. Right? The Federal Reserve didn't restore the economy to health. Right? They were saying, like, look, the economy uh, needs a little help. Right? Uh, just, you know, give it a crutch. Like, let's the Federal Reserve, you know, in, until the economy gets back on its feet, we'll give it this crutch, you know, 0% interest rates, and then, you know, when the economy is healthy again, you know, we'll take it away. We won't need it anymore. That's not what actually happened, right? We, the economy didn't get a crutch. Basically, the Federal Reserve chopped off the legs and, and gave the economy prosthetics and quantitative easing and 0% interest rates. And that's the only thing that's supporting the economy. You can't take you can't take those prosthetics away. That you, you, you can't walk. There's no the, 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 when people realize that all this is is a bubble, right? And Ben Bernanke wants to talk about oh what a success my policy was, right? Well, how do we know it's a success? Interest rates are still at zero. You can't claim it's a success until you normalize those rates. Let the Fed bring interest rates back up to five percent. Let it take its balance sheet from four and a half trillion back down to a trillion, and then tell me how successful the policy was. Because right now, all they've done is the easy part, right? It's like you know, you know, it, 
it, the easy part of uh, of uh, drugs is getting addicted. You know, anybody can start taking drugs. Right? It's easy to start a bad habit. The hard part is giving it up. Um, the greatest investment opportunity I've ever seen was shorting subprime mortgages in 2006 and seven. Since we've replaced the housing bubble with a government bubble, the next big bet is shorting it the U.S. government. How do you short the U.S. government? By shorting the dollar. The only way Uncle Sam can pretend to repay his debt is to put the printing presses into overdrive. This will divide the dollar, thus boosting the value of other currencies and gold. So brace yourselves for rapid inflation and the popping of the government bubble by buying physical gold, getting a diversified portfolio in dividend-paying global stocks and gold mining stocks, and holding a good mix of strong foreign currencies like Chinese RMB, Swiss franc, Canadian dollar, and the Australian dollar. So, I hope that throughout this presentation I established the credibility of the Austrian School of Economics by its predictive power, proved that the Fed intervention in the economy caused boom bust cycle and delays recovery, and showed how government used Fed policy to produce inflation, therefore stealing from its citizens subreptitiously because taxes are not politically good. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, uh, you, you can, you can. Sure.